Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support Bearded Book Club, you could do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. Number one, you could become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or number two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. The road from Ankh-Morpork to Kerm, or Cherm, is high, white, and winding, a 30-league stretch of potholes and half-buried rocks that spirals around mountains and dips into cool green valleys of citrus trees, crossed liana-webbed gorges on creaking rope bridges, and is generally more picturesque than useful. Picturesque. That was a new word to rinse when the wizard. Bachelors of Magician, Unseen University, bracket, failed. It was one of the number he had picked up since leaving the charred ruins of Ankh-Morpork. Quaint was another one. Picturesque meant, he decided later, he decided after careful observation of the scenery that inspired Two Flower to use the word, that the landscape was horribly precipitous. Quaint, when used to describe the occasional village through which they passed, meant f uh, fever-ridden and tumble-down. Two Flower was a tourist, the first ever seen on the Discworld. Tourist, Rincewind had decided, meant idiot. As they rode leisurely through the time-scented bee-humming air, Rincewind pondered on the experience of the last few days. While the little foreigner was obviously insane, he was also generous and considerably less lethal than half the people the wizard had mixed with in the, in the city. Rincewind, Rincewind rather liked him. Disliking him would be like kicking a puppy. Currently, Two Flower was showing a great interest in the theory and practice of magic. It all seems, well, rather useless to me, he said. I always thought that, you know, a wizard just said the magic words and that was that. Not all this tedious memorizing. Rincewin agreed moodily. He tried to explain that magic had indeed once been wild and lawless, but that had been tamed back in the mist of time by the olden ones, who had bound it to obey among, with other, th other things, the law of conservation of reality. This demanded that the effort needed to achieve a goal should be the same regardless of the means used. It, in practical terms, this meant that, say, creating the illusion of a glass of wine was relatively easy, easy since it involved merely the subtle shifting of light patterns. On the other hand, lifting a genuine wine glass a few feet in the air by sheer mental energy requires several hours of systematic preparation if the wizard wished to prevent the simple principle of leveraging of leverage flicking his brain out through his ears. He went on to add that some of the ancient magic could still be found in its raw state, recognizable to the initiated by the eightfold shape it made in the crystalline structure of space-time. There was the metal octyron, for example, and the gas octogen. Both radiated dangerous amounts of raw enchantment. It's all very depressing, he finished. Depressing? Rincewind turned in his saddle and glanced at Two Flower's luggage, which was currently ambling along on its little legs, occasionally snapping its lid at butterflies. He sighed. Rincewind thinks he ought to be able to harness the lightning, said the picture imp, who was observing the passing scene from the tiny doorway in the box slung around Two Flower's neck. He had spent the morning painting picture-esque views and quaint scenes for his master, and had been allowed to knock off for a smoke. When I said harness, I didn't mean harness, snapped Rincewind. I meant, well, I, I just meant that, I don't know, I just can't think of the right words. I just think the world ought to be sort of organized. That's just fantasy, said Two Flower. I know, that's the trouble, Rincewind sighed again. It was all very well going on about pure logic and how the universe had was ruled by logic and harmony of numbers, but the plain fact of the matter was that the disc was manifestly traversing space on the back of a giant turtle, and the gods had a habit of going around to atheist houses and smashing their windows. There was a faint sound, hardly louder than the noise of the bees in the rosemary by the road. It had a curiously bony quality, as if rolling skulls or a whirling dice box. Rincewind peered around. There was no one nearby. For some reason, that worried him. Then came a slight breeze that grew and went in the space of a few heartbeats. 
it left the world unchanged saved in a few interesting particulars. There was now, for example, a five-meter-tall mountain troll standing in the road. It was exceptionally angry. This was partly because trolls generally are, in any case, but it was exacerbated by the fact that the sudden and instantaneous teleportation from its lair in the Ramorok, Ramorok Mountains 3,000 miles away and 1,000 yards closer to the rim had raised its internal temperature to a dangerous level, in accordance with the laws of conservation of energy. So it bared its fangs and charged. What a strange creature, Two Flower remarked. Is it dangerous? Only to people, shouted Rincewin. He drew his sword and with a smooth overarm throw completely failed to hit the troll. The blade plunged out into the heather at the side of the track. There was the faintest of sounds, like the rattle of old teeth. The sword struck a boulder concealed in the heather, concealed, a watcher might have considered, so artfully that a moment before it had not appeared to be there at all, it sprang up like a leaping salmon and mid-ricochet plunged deeply into the back of the troll's gray neck. The creature grunted, and with one swipe of a claw gouged a wound in the flank of Two Flower's horse, which screamed and bolted into the trees at the roadside. The troll spun around and made a grab for Rincewind. Then its sluggish nervous system brought it the message that it was dead. It looked surprised for a moment, and then toppled over and shattered into gravel. Trolls being silicious life forms, their bodies revert instantly to stone at the moment of death. Ugh, thought Rincewind as his horse reared in terror. He hung on desperately as it staggered two-legged across the road and then, screaming, turned and galloped into the woods. The sound of hoofbeats died away, leaving the air to the hum of bees and the occasional rustle of butterfly wings. There was another sound, too, a strange noise for the bright time of noonday. It sounded like dice. Rincewind the long isle of trees threw Two Flower's voice from side to side and eventually tossed it back to him unheeded. He sat down on a rock and tried to think. Firstly, he was lost. That was vexing, but it did not worry him unduly. The forest looked quite interesting and probably held elves or gnomes, perhaps both. In fact, on a couple of occasions, he had thought that he had seen strange green faces peering down at him from the branches. Two Flower had always wanted to meet an elf. In fact, what he really wanted to meet was a dragon, but an elf would do, or a real goblin. His luggage was missing, and that was annoying. It was also starting to rain. He squirmed uncomfortably on the damp stone and tried to look on the bright side. For example, during his mad dash, his plunging horse had burst through some bushes and disturbed a she-bear with her cubs, but he had gone on before the bear could react. Then it had suddenly been galloping over the sleeping bodies of a large wolf pack and, again, its mad speed had been such that the furious yelping had been left far behind. Nevertheless, the day was wearing on and perhaps it would be a good idea, Two Flower thought, not to hang about in the open. Perhaps there was a... He racked his brains trying to remember what sort of accommodations Forrest traditionally offered. Perhaps there was a gingerbread house or something. The stone really was uncomfortable. Two Flower looked down and for the first time noticed the strange carving. It looked like a spider, or was it a squid? Moss and lichen rather blurred the precise details, but they didn't blur the runes carved below it. Two Flower could read them clearly, and they said, Traveler, the hospitable temple of Bel Shamharoth lies 1,000 paces hubward. Now this was strange, Two Flower realized, because although he could read the message, the actual letters were completely unknown to him. Somehow the message was arriving in his brain without the tedious necessity of passing through his eyes. He stood up and untied his now biddable horse from the sapling. He wasn't sure which way the hub lay, but there seemed to be an old track of sorts leading away between the trees. This Bel Shamharoth seemed prepared to go out of his way to help stranded travelers. In any case, it was that or the wolves. Two Flower nodded decisively. It is interesting to note that several hours later, a couple of wolves who were following Two Flower Scent arrived in the glade. Their green eyes fell on the strange eight-legged carving, which may indeed have been a spider or an octopus, or may yet again have been something altogether more strange, and they immediately decided that they weren't so hungry at that. About three miles away, a failed wizard was hanging by his hands from a big branch in a beech tree. This was the end result of five minutes of crowded activity. 
First, an enraged she-bear had barged through the undergrowth and taken the throat out of his horse with, horse with one swipe of her paw. Then, as Rincewind had fled the carnage, he had run into a glade in which a number of irate wolves were milling about. His instructors at Unseen University, who had despaired of Rincewind's inability to master levitation, would then have been amazed at the speed with which he reached and climbed the nearest tree without apparently touching it. Now there was just the matter of the snake. It was large and green and wound itself along the branch with reptilian patience. Rincewind wondered if it was poisonous, then chided himself for asking such a silly question. Of course it would be poisonous. What are you grinning for? he asked the figure on the next branch. I can't help it, said Death. Now would you be so kind as to let go? I can't hang around all day. I can, said Rincewind defiantly. The wolves clustered around the base of the tree, looking up with interest at their next meal, talking to himself. It won't hurt, said Death. In wor if words had weight, a single sentence from Death would have anchored a ship. Rincewind's arms screamed their agony at him. He scowled at the vulture-like, slightly transparent figures. Won't hurt, he said. Being torn apart by wolves won't hurt. He noticed another branch crossing his dangerously narrowing one a few feet away. If he could just reach it. He swung himself forward, one hand outstretched. The branch, already bending, did not break. It simply made a w wet little sound and twisted. Rincewind found that he was now hanging on to the end of a tongue of bark and fiber, lengthening as it peeled away from the tree. He looked down and with a sort of fatal satisfaction realized that he would land right on the biggest wolf. Now he was moving slowly as the bark peeled back in longer and longer strip. The snake watched him thoughtfully. By the growing length of bark, but the growing length of bark held. Rincewind began to congratulate himself until, looking up, he saw that he had hitherto not noticed there was the largest hornet's nest he had ever seen hanging right in his path. He shut his eyes tightly. Why the troll? he asked himself. Everything else is just my usual luck, but why the troll? What the hell is going on? Click. It may have been a twig snapping, except that the sound appeared to be inside Rincewind's head. Click, click. And a breeze that failed to set a single leaf a tremble. The hornet's nest was ripped from the branch as the strip passed by. It shot past the wizard's head, and he watched it grow smaller as it plummeted toward the circle of upturned muzzles. The circle suddenly closed. The circle suddenly expanded. The concerted yelp of pain as the pack fought to escape the furious cloud echoed among the trees. Rincewind grinned inanely. Rincewind's elbow nudged something. It was the tree trunk. The strip had carried him right to the end of the branch. But there was no other branches. The smooth bark beside him offered no handholds. It offered hands, though. Two were even now thrusting through the mossy bark beside him, slim hands green as young leaves. Then a shapely arm followed, and then the hamadryad leaned right out and gray grasped the astonished wizard firmly, and with that vegetable strength that can send roots questing into rock, drew him into the tree. The solid bark parted like a mist, closed like a clam. Death watched impassively. He glanced at the cloud of mayflies that were dancing their joyous zigzags near his skull. He snapped his fingers. The insects fell out of the air, but somehow it wasn't quite the same. Blind Dio pushed his stack of chips across the table, glowered through such of his eyes that were currently in the room, and strode out. <clears throat> A few demigods tittered. At least Offler had taken the loss of a perfectly good troll with precise, if somewhat reptilian, grace. The lady's last opponent shifted his seat until he faced her across the board. Lord, she said politely. Lady, he acknowledged. Their eyes met. He was a taciturn god. It was said that he arrived in the Discworld after some terrible and mysterious incident in another eventuality. It is, of course, the privilege of gods to control their apparent outward form, even to other gods. The fate of the Discworld was currently a kindly man in late middle age, graying hair brushed neatly around features that a maiden would confidently proffer a glass of small beer to. 
should they appear at her back door. It was a face a kindly youth would gladly help over a stile, except for his eyes, of course. No deity can disguise the manner and nature of his eyes. The nature of the two set of the two eyes of the fate of the Discworld was this, that while at a mere glance they were simply dark, a closer look would reveal too late that they were but holes opening into a blackness so remote, so deep that the watcher would feel himself inexorably drawn into the twin pools of infinite night and their terrible wheeling stars. The lady coughed politely and laid twenty-one white chips on the table. Then from her robe she took another chip, silvery and translucent, and twice the size of the others. The soul of a true hero always finds a better rate of exchange and is valued highly by the gods. Fate raised an eyebrow. And no cheating, lady, he said. But who could cheat fate, she asked. He shrugged. No one, yet everyone tries. And yet again, I believe you felt, I felt you giving me a little assistance against the others. But of course, so that the end game could be the sweeter lady. And now? He reached into his gaming box and brought forth a piece, setting it down on the board with a satisfied air. <clears throat> the watching deities gave a collective sigh. Even the lady was momentarily taken aback. It was certainly ugly. The carving was uncertain, as if the craftsman's hands were shaking in horror of the thing taking shape under his reluctant fingers. It seemed to be all suckers and tentacles and mandibles, the lady observed, and one great eye. I thought such as he died out at the beginning of time, he said, she said. Mayhaps our necrotic friend was loath even to go near this one, laughed Fate. He was enjoying himself. It should never have been spawned. Nevertheless, said Fate nomically, he scooped the dice into their usual box and then glanced up at her. Unless he added, you wish to resign. She shook her head. Play, she said. You can match my stake? Play. Rintwin knew what was inside trees, wood, sap, possibly squir squirrels, not a palace. Still the cushions underneath him were definitely softer than wood, the wine in the wooden cup beside him was much tastier than sap, and there could be absolutely no comparison between a squirrel and the girl sitting before him, clasping her knees and watching him thoughtfully, unless mention was made of certain hints of furriness. The room was high, wide, and lit with a soft yellow light with, which came from no particular source that Rincewind could identify. Through gnarled and knotted archways, he could see other rooms, and what looked like a very large winding staircase, and it had looked a perfectly normal tree from the outside, too. The girl was green, flesh green. Rincewind could be absolutely certain about that, because all she was wearing was a medallion around her neck. Her long hair had a faintly mossy look about it. Her eyes had no pupils and were a luminous green. Rincewind wished he had paid more attention to anthropology lectures at university. She had said nothing, apart from indicating the couch and offering him the wine, she had done no more than sit watching him, occasionally rubbing a deep scratch on her arm. Rincewind hurriedly recalled that a dryad was so linked to her tree that she suffered wounds in sympathy. Sorry about that, he said quickly. It was just an accident. I mean, there were these wolves and... You had to climb my tree and I rescued you, said the dryad smoothly. How lucky for you. And for your friend, perhaps? Friend? The little man with the magic box, said the dryad. Oh, sure, him, Rincewind said vaguely. Yeah, I hope he's okay. He needs your help. He usually does. Did he make it to a tree too? He made it to the temple of Belshamharath. Rincewin choked on his wine. His ears tried to crawl into his head in terror of the syllables that he had just heard. The Soul Eater. Before he could stop them, the memories came galloping back. Once, while a student of practical magic at Unseen University, and, for a bet, he'd slipped into the little room off the main library the room with the walls covered in protective lead pentagrams, 
the room no one was allowed to occupy for more than four minutes and 32 seconds, which was a figure arrived at after 200 years of cautious experimentation. He had gingerly opened the book, which was chained to the octiron pedestal in the middle of the rune-strewn floor, not lest someone steal it, but lest it escape. For it was the octavo, so full of magic that it had its own vague sentience. One spell had indeed leapt from the crackling pages and lodged itself in the dark recesses of his brain. And apart from knowing that it was one of the eight great spells, no one would know which one until he said it. Even Rincewind did not, but he could feel it sometimes, sidling out of eight, out of sight behind his ego, biding its time. On the front of the octavo had been a representation of Belshamharoth. He was not evil, for evil has a certain vitality. Belshamharoth was the flip side of the coin of which good and evil are but one side. The soul eater, his number lieth between seven and nine, it is twice four, Rincewind quoted, his mind frozen with fear. Oh no, where's the temple? Hubward, toward the center of the forest, said the dryad, it is very old. But who would be so stupid as to worship Bet him? I mean, devils, yes, but he's the soul eater. There were certain advantages, and the race that used to live in these parts had strange notions. What happened to them, then? I did say they used to live in these parts. The dryad stood up and stretched out her hand. Come, I am Jule. Come with me and watch your friend's fate. It should be interesting. I'm not sure that, began Rincewin. The dryad turned her green eyes on him. Do you believe you have a choice? She asked. A staircase broad as a major highway wound up through the tree. With vast rooms leading off in, at every landing, the sourceless yellow light was everywhere. There was also a sound like, Rincewind concentrated trying to identify it, like a far-off thunder or a distant waterfall. It's the tree, said the dryad shortly. What's it doing? said Rincewind. Living. I wondered about that. I mean, are we really in a tree? Have I been reduced in size? From outside it looked narrow enough for me to put my arms around. It is. Um, but here I am inside it? You are. Um, said Rincewind. Druillet laughed. I can see into your mind, false wizard. Am I not a dryad? Do you not know that what you belittle by the name tree is but the mere four-dimensional analog of a whole multi-dimensional universe which... No, I can see you do not. I should have realized that you weren't a real wizard when I saw you didn't have a staff. Lost it in a fire, lied Rincewind automatically. No hat with magic sigils embroidered on it. It blew off. No familiar. It died. Look, thanks for rescuing me, but if you don't mind, I think I ought to be going. If you could show me the way out... Something in her expression made him turn around. There was a three he dryads behind him. They were as naked as the woman and unarmed. The last fact was irrelevant, however. They didn't look as though they would need weapons to fight Rincewind. They looked as though they could shoulder their way through ro solid rock and beat up a regiment of trolls into the bargain. The three handsome giants looked down at him with wooden menace. Their skins were the color of walnut husk, and under it muscles bulged like sacks of melons. He turned around again and grinned weakly at Drule. Life was beginning to take on a familiar shape again. I'm not rescued, am I? he said. I'm captured, right? Of course. And you're not letting me go. It was a statement. Drule shook her head. You hurt the tree, but you are lucky. Your friend is going to meet Belshamharoth. You will only die. From behind two hands gripped his shoulders in such the same way that an old tree root coils relentlessly around a pebble. With a certain amount of ceremony, of course, the dryad went on, after the sender of eight has finished with your friend. All Rincewind could manage to say was, you know, I never imagined there were he dryads, not even in an oak tree. One of the giants grinned at him. Drule snorted, stupid, where do you think acorns come from? There was a vast empty space like a hall. It's a roof lost in golden haze. The endless stairs ran right up through it. Several hundred dryads were clustered at the other end of the hall. 
They parted respectfully when Droulet approached and stared through rinse when, as though he was propelled firmly along behind. Most of them were females, although there were a few of the giant males among them. They stood like god-shaped statues among the small, intelligent females. Insect, insects, thought Rincewind. The tree is like a hive. But why were there dryads at all? As far as he could recall, the tree people had died out centuries before. They had been out-evolved by humans, like most of the other Twilight peoples. Only elves and trolls had survived the coming of man to the Discworld. The elves because they were altogether too clever by half, and the trolling folk because they were as least as good as humans at being nasty, spiteful, and greedy. Dryads were supposed to have died out, along with gnomes and pixies. The background roar was louder here. Sometimes a pulsing golden glow would race up the translucent walls until it was lost in the haze overhead. Some power in the air made it vibrate. Oh, incompetent wizard said Drouillet. See some magic. Not your weasel face tame magic, but root and branch magic. The old magic. Wild magic. Watch. Fifty or so of the females formed a tight cluster, joined hands, and walked backwards until they formed the circumference of a large circle. The rest of the dryads began a low chant. Then at a nod from Drouillet, the circle began to spin Wittershins. As the pace began to quicken and the complicated threads of the chant began to rise, Rincewind found himself watching, fascinated. He had heard about the old magic at university, although it was forbidden to wizards. He knew that when the circle was spinning fast enough against the standing magical field of the Discworld itself, in its slow turning, the resulting astral friction would build up a vast potential difference, which would earth itself by a vast discharge of the elemental magical force. The circle was a blur now, and the walls of the tree rang with the echoes of the chant. Rincewind felt the familiar sticky prickling in the scalp that indicated the build-up of a heavy charge of raw enchantment in the vicinity, and so he was not utterly amazed when, a few seconds later, a shaft of vivid octarine light speared down from the invisible ceiling and focused crackling in the center of the circle. There it formed an image of a storm-swept, tree-girt hall with a temple on its crest. Its shape did unpleasant things to the eye. Rincewind knew that it was the temple of Belshamharoth. It would have eight sides. Eight was also the number of Belshamharoth, which was why a sensible wizard would never mention the number if he could avoid it. Or you'll be eight alive. Apprentices were jocularly warned. Belshamharoth was especially attracted to dabblers in magic who... By being as it was, it were beachcombers on the shores of the unnatural. Were already half enmeshed in his nets. Rincewind's room number in his hall of residence had been 7A. He hadn't been surprised.